Hi, friends. This is Engage 360 from Denver Seminary. I'm Don Payne, your host for this episode. And before we begin, I just wanted to let you know that some of the material in this episode uh, may be problematic or triggering for some listeners. This podcast episode contains discussions of gun violence. And so we do advise listener discretion, especially for any individuals who uh, might be sensitive to or have been affected by this kind of content. Please take good care of yourself and prioritize your own mental well-being while you're listening. And if you find the topic overly distressing, we encourage you to seek support or maybe even to skip this episode. Welcome to Engage 360, Denver Seminary's podcast. Join us as we explore the redemptive power of the gospel and the life-changing truth of scripture at work in our culture today. Welcome, friends, to Engage 360 at Denver Seminary. We are very grateful for you spending some time with us. My name is Don Payne. I'll be your host for today. And we have a very important topic to discuss. One of the most tragic plagues in the U.S. is the rise in gun violence. As we are recording this, we are coming up on the 25th anniversary of the shootings at Columbine High School, which is only a few miles from our campus. And that type of tragedy has only increased and gets more national attention. But the gun violence that does not get attention affects even more lives. Uh, Running parallel to the wrenching effects of this trend are the polarized and the sometimes paralyzed public reactions about what to do. So we're really honored to have as our guest on this episode someone who has given considerable attention and has devoted substantial research to that problem. Uh, Dr. Michael Austin, uh, who is Foundation Professor of Philosophy at Eastern Kentucky University. Dr. Austin, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. We are very grateful that you could spend some time with us. Um, And he's also going to be one of our uh, key presenters at the upcoming Gospel Initiative event uh, on this very topic. Uh, Dr. Austin's uh, research has focused a lot on ethics and spiritual formation, um, especially issues related to character and connections between character and the common good. He has published 15 books, including God and Guns in America, which came out in 2020, and that will be the subject of some of our, our conversation today. Um, Dr. Austin, tell us a little bit first about your background and how this came to be an area of such attention for you. Yeah, it wasn't intentional. Um, sometimes I think of like what I want to do next and have a plan, but I had read some stuff online and saw people sort of defending what different kind of views about guns that were Christians and kind of like a lot of issues, definitely some proof texting and not some well thought out things. And so I wanted, it struck me wrong. So I thought, well, I want to look into this more, did a little online writing in some venues. And then, yeah, I was in conversation with Erdman's, the publisher, and they were looking for somebody to sort of write something like this ended up being sort of a, some kind of compromise position, right? So when we normally think of gun violence in America, we think of you know, some views like abolish the second amendment at one extreme and almost everything goes at the other. And neither of those I thought were necessarily, well, I w- actually, I wanted to see what Christian ethics would have to say about that. Look at scripture with these questions in mind. So I ended up writing the book. Um, yeah. in 2018, 2019 came out, as you said, in 2020. So I got it. And plus, as I mentioned, I mentioned this at the preface or start of the book, I grew up in Kansas. And so I grew up around guns. My dad's a hunter. I mentioned in the start of the book that I owned a rifle before I was born. My dad bought me a 22 rifle at TGNY, an old discount store. Oh, I remember <laughs> that place. Yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned that to my students today. I'm teaching a class on violence and honor seminar. And of course, none of them knew what it was, but I didn't expect they would. But anyway, so it's been a part of my family, hunting and shooting sports for a long time. It was normal for me. And so I was interested to look into those yeah, just the ethical issues from a perspective of Christian, of scripture and Christian thought. That's um, something we may want to come back to, but I find that to be a somewhat uh, unusual posture uh, because uh, many who engage uh, topics about guns, gun control, gun violence, will will apparently uh, often come at this from a, a rather polarized position, either utterly terrified of guns, no 
background with guns, no tolerance for guns, no interest in guns, or uh, you know, full on uh, guns are everything. And so it's, yeah. it is interesting to have somebody engage this topic as a gun owner. Yeah, that, that's the thing too. I think you're right. I think a lot of the, I mean, people that are maybe to the, I hate, I mean, to my right, I guess, about guns on towards that end of the spectrum, right, you often get the question, well, about do you own guns? Are you familiar with them? Because there's sort of a, a credibility issue, right? And how right. can you make a strong claim if you don't know anything about them? I and that's true. People say things about guns that just factually aren't true. Um, and then people on the left, a little cons- to my left, more concerned about giving too much, so to speak, to the gun culture. But yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, I struggled in the book. Like when I actually started reading scripture about violence more generally, I found myself not there, but closer to a some kind of pacifist or nonviolent situation or position that I was before, but still think that there's a ground in between for gun violence and violence in general. Mm-hmm. You know, I suppose we, we have two levels of this conversation. One level that many are familiar with would be the, the, the topic of gun control. And there, of course, we get into immediate legislative uh, issues, legislative questions. Um, but the, the topic of gun violence seems to be uh, somewhat larger than the specific issue of gun control, though certainly they're related. Um, so when we're thinking about gun violence, that has been that has been more the focus of your research, right? Even though it may have some implications for the question of gun control. Yes, that's right. And and usually the debate just, I mean, we, we know the news cycle, something happens. And as you mentioned, usually it's a mass shooting. And even those aren't the things that that's a small fraction of the deaths by gun violence each year. And then you get, we need gun control. We don't need it. And then we kind of move on to the next one, but gun violence is a lot broader. Um, people that are, you know, suffer not just mass shooting, but murder, um, defensive gun uses, suicide by gun, people that are injured, or even just psychological trauma. So there are a lot of both issues related to gun violence that really don't have don't immediately take us to the gun control question. And there are a lot of strategies, is the way I would put it, to reduce gun violence that don't necessitate changing the law. I mean, I think there are some good things we could do in the law, and I'm sure we'll get to that. But but broadly speaking, there's a lot that we can do as a church, as the church of Christ of Jesus Christ to reduce gun violence. That doesn't have anything to do with the public policy debates necessarily. Well, I'm really glad that your, your research and your thinking has focused in that direction because it seems like, uh, there is a, <clears throat> as I said in the intro, a lot of, uh, paralysis, uh, or, mm-hmm. or maybe even a sense of helplessness. If we can't legislate it, uh, and we can't ignore it, then what in the world can we do that is of any substantial um, impact? But uh, before we loop back into that, yeah. I'd be curious to know what are some of the results of your your research on gun violence? Yeah, so like big picture, to kind of cover the broadest ground, my the view I landed on, because I really, I mean, I had some opinions before I started this, but I thought I'm just, I don't know enough to like have a firm conviction. And uh, as I got into it, I think for me, my like big conclusion was that, that we really can reduce gun violence in the United States without, or while actually still protecting the rights of responsible gun owners in ways that are, you know, true to the second amendment, and th- and that as Christians, we have special reasons to do so, just given our views about, you know, human dignity and human beings made in God's image and that, that God's, even though there is violence in scripture, right? It seems like in general, it's something God, you know, rejects, you know, de- I mean, for a lot of different reasons, we're called to peace, even if in a fallen world, that's difficult. Mm-hmm. So those things came to mind. And really, I just had no idea. I'd heard numbers, but when I start, you know, when you realize that depending on the year, roughly give or take 60% of deaths by gun violence in the U S or by suicide, right? That changes the focus of the discussion in many ways or suggests a lot of things we could do that, that aren't related to, you know, gun control necessarily, um, things that we can do policy wise, but also as a church. So, you know, as followers of Jesus and just as human beings, that gives a special burden, I think for us that, that we need to do something. How about trends? You you kind of alluded to this, but what what kinds of trends have you seen? Yeah, so if you look, the gun violence archive I like as a source of data because, and I'll explain why in a minute. But they they have a kind of strict, verifiable data. So they 
you go back to roughly 2014, there were about 32,000 deaths by gun violence in the United States. And then in 2022, somewhere around 47,000. So in those roughly eight or nine years, you know, went from 32,000 to, to 47,000. There's been a dip in 2023. But one thing that's interesting, interesting is they, they no longer, like for 2023, they don't have data for suicide. Um, because the the data they were getting from the CDC didn't really meet their tests, so they're they're trying to figure out that. But basically, the upward trend is what I've seen in gun violence, and that and that's that's alarming, right? Because it's and it's not just the mass shootings; it's all these other things. Yeah, you know, and maybe maybe we should even more carefully define the the phrase gun violence because mm-hmm. that can that can connote. A, a sort of uh, conscious, intentional uh, act of aggression from one person to another. But are are we talking about it more broadly, just death by gun? Yeah, that's a good point. It is death or injury, like death by gun or injury. So that would include, you know, things like murder, homicide, but it would also, a suicide, as we've talked about, but it would include defensive gun uses, right? So someone who's using a gun in self-defense or defend their family. It would include accidental deaths and injuries by guns. And th- those happen often by children because of adults who leave guns out um, or who are easily accessible by children. So yeah, gun, it's you, the gun violence is the term, but you're right. It includes, it's really broad. Basically anytime there's a death or an injury by a gun or a gun's involved um, that and fired, that's, that's gun violence in the discussion. Yeah. Well, I'm particularly curious about children. Um, you, mm-hmm. you mentioned that's a significant number or a significant percentage of deaths by gun from like parents who leave guns out, leave guns unattended. Do you have any isolated, uh, sort of disaggregated um, stats on how many of these are affected or, or involve children? Yeah, I, it was hard to find because they have, um, I'd have to go back and look, but it, but what I will say is the rate of like suicide, the rate of just suicides, the 10 to 24, so that's children plus, you know, early 20s, that's the fastest growing demographic in terms of the rate of increase. I think it was a hundred and forty percent increase from twenty twenty two to twenty twenty three. So as far as like hard numbers, I don't I don't have those right now, but it's increasing. Um, accidental deaths, I think involving children over like around one hundred and forty. I want to say in twenty twenty two, were were died due to that. So that could be. And this was one of the really difficult things when I worked on the book is coming across like actual concrete stories. Cause we, you know, we throw around numbers and when you start hearing mm-hmm. stories, um, you know, there was something in my, where I live now in Kentucky of a, a, a younger than five-year-old who killed his two-year-old cousin with a gun that, that a grandfather had left on the coffee table. Right. Mm-hmm. So just, you know, other times it's where parents think kids don't know where the guns are, but they're not secured by a safe or by some kind of locking mechanism where kids find them uh, and either accidentally shoot themselves or another person. So yeah, that's a, a difficult trend. Well, that does, that does kind of suggest, uh, doesn't it, that, that in a, a kind of a meaning, a meaningful set of strategies has to be quite diverse because we're, we're not talking about any, when we talk about gun violence, we're talking about a number of different things um, that, that all involve death by gun. Um, but that would imply quite a, a quite a varied approach or a set of approaches to try to uh, uh, meaningfully address all this, would it not? Yeah, most certainly, right? So the things that would be effective at reducing suicide by gun are not going to have much impact necessarily, or at least not in the same way as murder or domestic violence or homicide or accidents, you know? So there'll be overlap in the strategies, but, and I said this more generally, there's no as much as we want that, there's no like one or two laws that are just going to solve the problem. Um, they, and so my approach, and I think others, and it's a wise approach is it's a, it's a patchwork, not in a bad way, but there are mm. different things we can do to reduce gun violence, you know, in a fallen world, we're not, I mean, it's, I, I'd love it if there was no gun, no one died from a fire in the United States or in the world, that would be great. Um, but I don't know of any magic law. But just like other laws, we can do things to reduce it and protect rights at the same time. So, but yeah, you're actually, that's exactly right. There's no one size fits all solution because there's no one size fits all problem. Well, yeah. And, and what you're describing is, is far more of a realist position because, Mm -hmm. you know, from, from one end of the spectrum and, and this is always heard, 
from one end of the spectrum, uh, the outcry is, well, just get rid of all the guns. Yeah. If you if you have no guns, you have no death by guns, which, you know, mathematically, that computes. But realistically, at least in the U.S., we're not in a place where guns are just going to disappear. Yeah. Um, so a, a different set of tactics, uh, far more nuanced, far more complex, perhaps, and far more patient. Um, would would seem to be the order of the day. Um, you you do talk, and you you alluded to this a moment ago uh, in your book, God and Guns in America. You you suggest a biblical non pacifist perspective. Say more about that. What does that mean? Yeah, and I think we we tend to think of like the two biblical views within different Christian traditions as basically sort of just war theory or justified violence theory, right? That under certain situations, whether it's in warfare, wars of self-defense or protecting vulnerable other nations, and then those things apply at the individual level, or you know, so where violence is justified with a certain set of conditions. Um, and then the other major school is pacifism of some sort, right? That that we're supposed to reject all forms of violence as followers of Jesus. And look, I see, I see like there's, you can make a, a, at least a plausible initial case for both of those from scripture. That's why, you know, I think that's why there's not unanimity, at least one reason on, on, on Christian ethics on this in different traditions. Uh, so for me, I think it, you know, it's what, it's something like Bonhoeffer actually is probably something like this, where he was like his default position. And I think this is the right one should be pacifism or peace building. Let's say peace building is what I say in the book to avoid some of the connotations. Like we should be working to foster peace. We should do all that we can to create peace, both whether it's in a family or between nations or, you know, in a society, that's the default position. But there just seem to be in a fallen world cases where maybe there's such a, a greater, a good require, a, something that's valuable requires the use of violence in a fallen world. So that's why I think Bonhoeffer took part in the, uh, you know, he was part of the plot to assassinate Hitler as a self-described pacifist because mm -hmm. he realized in a fallen world, in extreme situations, there are times where violence actually does prevent great evil. And so I think my, what I want to push in the book and even more since then is that as Americans and American Christians, there are large segments of us that we go to violence too quickly or we're too quick to say it's justified. And so I, I want to like place the burden of proof on acting in violence rather than sort of it being a default that is often a go-to in our, in our country. Okay. So when you talk about peace building, pacifism, uh, that that whole discussion uh, certainly presumes a choice between uh, taking a consciously, intentionally violent approach or an aggressive approach to something or, or not doing that. Uh, as we, or I should say, how do you factor that, figure that into um, just this broader discussion of gun violence where in many instances it may not be conscious acts of aggression involved? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, connect those dots for us. Yeah, that's right. So in, so as Christians, then we're thinking about this question, if, the, if what, I mean, the, you know, in the long run, right, ultimately those swords will be beaten into plowshares and, right. And we need to work towards that now, but that's, as we've said, or as you've mentioned, it's going to look differently. So yeah, what are some, what are some things where people just react in violence spontaneously? This goes to, you know, things that are near and dear to my heart, things about character formation and spiritual formation and and sort of, and the, the presence of anger, um, and, and how that leads to violence. These, you know, as many people point out, it's not just a gun problem or some would say it's not a gun problem. It's a sin problem. I want to argue it's both, but it is a sin problem, right? It's a fallen human beings. And so what can we do to, yeah, I just think of the ways anger, whether it's in domestic violence situations or stalking or this different kind of things, or even abuse of children. And then with gun violence, um, how presence of a gun in the home can exacerbate those kind of situations. And so, yeah, I think it's not always conscious. Then you think, well, how can we provide, how can the church, I think specifically provide the kind of support for people in our community where those things happen less, where people, where violence, people aren't not pushed to violence. I don't want to say it that way, but where, where they're more apt to act in violent ways because of things internal to them and things external to them. What can we do to help people? and where that's not their reaction. So that's all kind of vague, but I think, I mean, just think about, I mean, the church already does things about gun violence, couple care, engaging youth in society, in a 
providing job training, alleviating loneliness. And those are actually gun violence reduction strategies. Strategies We just don't think of them that way. Right. We, we may not make those links. And that's interesting yeah. um, that you put it that way, because when we, when we isolate gun violence as a particular form of violence, we're really talking about a particular iteration or set of iterations of violence. And maybe, I'm sure you've thought about this. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, maybe one of our approaches, our strategies has to be to address just the culture of violence, whether it's related to guns or not. What is, uh, what, what is it that fosters the kind of violence or inclination toward violence that seems to characterize so many people in this country anyway? Uh, and, and I think I could safely say, in many cases, Christian and non-Christian alike. There's, there is an undercurrent or uh, a, a, an undertow of violence that may not iterate in overt, explicit acts of aggression, but they, they, they put us ever closer to that, given the right kind of promptings. Yeah. Does that, does that make any that's sense? That's right. No, yeah, it definitely does. I mean, I've thought about this recently. It does seem like like the space between when there's conflict or any kind of disagreement, like the gap between that initial, whether it's a verbal or whatever's going on and violence, it just seems that it, that it's gotten smaller in some ways. It makes me think of like the, I don't want to alienate your listeners from Denver. I grew up in Kansas city, so I'm a Chiefs fan, but, <laughs> um, yeah, we, we'll just, but we'll just edit all that. We'll just, yeah, <laughs> you can just get that out. So I'm not, you know, people don't shut me out after this, but, um, but yeah, you know, the, the Super Bowl parade and the, the incident that happened yeah. there. Right. So there were, there were two people in a disagreement. One pulled a gun, the other pulled a gun. And then at least 12 other people pulled firearms in that vicinity. Um, and at least six of them fired their weapon. So it's kind of amazing that only one person was killed and 22 yeah. injured. Yeah. But just the, the escalation from a disagreement to now people are pulling, pulling out weapons, you know, weapons designed or that can kill. And so I think. I mean, I guess I'd put it this way. When I was growing up in Kansas City in the 70s and 80s in middle school and high school, a fight at school was just going to be a fight, right? And, you know, maybe they're not in my school, so maybe a knife some places. But now, I mean, you have to think about or road rage. You have to think about presence of firearms. And it's not just the presence of firearms. It's that plus, as you mentioned, the sort of, we just seem angrier. And um, that's not a unique observation, but it just seems like we are, as it, just generally in America. And to see Christians kind of, be influenced by the culture in that way. Um, it, it's distressing. I've noticed it in myself sometimes and think I just have to guard against because there's seems like there are these pressures to anger in our culture and to sort of seeing other Americans, even other Christians as our enemies, rather than just fellow Americans or fellow Christians we have disagreements with, we start seeing them as enemies. And once you see somebody that way, start seeing them as maybe morally or spiritually or culturally inferior to you, there's plenty of sort of social scientific evidence that that removes some barriers uh, to violence as empathy gets undermined. And as Christians, empathy is vital because that's, you know, it's the heart of all these important Christian virtues, compassion, right. love, um, all those sorts of things. So, yeah. Right. It's well, a, you're, you're putting your finger on all these, these under layers mm -hmm. to, to gun violence, which, and, and I wonder whether we can meaningfully uh, even address I even try to address gun violence without address without addressing those under layers of violence. What does it mean to be a violent society? What are the contributing factors to that? What what are um, what what are some of the shifts maybe over over time in particular cultures toward more violent um, predispositions people have? Mm -hmm. uh, and and of course this has been analyzed from a number of different angles, not least media. You know, violence in in film, violence. Uh, portrayed in entertainment venues um, that 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 glorifies that desensitizes us to violence of various forms. Um, of course, that 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 pushes the discussion into a lot of different places. But I wonder, you know, if we can even have a meaningful discussion about gun violence without addressing those those things that might even be closer to home for people who don't own guns. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to, as you mentioned. You know, if you think of gun violence as just one subcategory or subset, so to speak, of violence in general in the United States that includes, you know, different weapons, physical, verbal aggression. And so, yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard, to, it'd be like 
trying to solve, you know, cure disease without looking at a bunch of the, you know, maybe looking at one cause, but not a bunch of other seven or eight causes, right? In, in terms of physical health, we just can't yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which makes, in some ways, makes the problem more daunting um, because it's, you know, it's this it's part of this larger issue. Yeah. But, but I think when we think of it more broadly, as I've already mentioned, than just public policy stuff, we include that, but go beyond that. Then we start seeing things the church can do where we don't have to depend on the government or on law enforcement, you know, where there, I mean, there are things we can actually do just, yeah, you know, to, to address the problem and try to try to bring the kingdom of God to bear on this part of society. Yeah. Well, in service to that, why do you think this conversation gets so polarized and so stuck? Yeah, I think a big part of it is both for Christians and non-Christians, like the, this guns play a unique role in some ways in American history, right? I mean, it's part of like our nation was founded after an, uh, an armed revolution. Um, Second Amendment is a unique, fairly unique kind of to our founding documents, right? And not of, there aren't other nations that have it, something like that. Um, even if they allow, you know, for presence of firearms and those kind of things, it's not this core belief from the beginning for most other nations. And I, I think when you, you go beyond just our, our history, it becomes a part of people's identity. Like in my own childhood, like what, you know, I just grew up, there was a gun cabinet in, on our, in our family room, the same room where we watched yeah. television. And yeah. it wasn't, my dad got a safe in later years, but at the time it was one of those little just wood with a glass front, little chintzy lock that, you know, like you see the story slide over and we just, right. that was just normal. Um, but I think it's a part of people's identity in certain ways that like we think of ourselves. So Christians think of ourselves as Christians first and foremost, obviously, or at least we should. Um, but you know, whether it's Christians or others in America, we think of ourselves as Americans that, that, that connotates sort of the, like the history of you know, and guns in America, the revolution, the wild West, you know, group, well, I still love Westerns, right? But I think there's a family thing here too, like a family tradition of passing guns down or that this is part of our family, right? That we, guns are part of what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's probably been a year or two ago now, I was at the barber uh, here in Kentucky. And one of the ones I went to, the guy had like in his pocket, just a small firearm. That's something that his grandfather had passed down to his dad and passed down to him, right? And so it's not just an idea, but it's when, so when someone says guns are evil, some people hear that as you're evil. And you need to get rid of your guns, right? And so it's hard to have a a uh, sort of non-polarized discussion when you feel personally attacked in that way. Uh, that's that's very interesting. I, I that had never occurred to me that the, the the sense of identity that many people have with guns is uh, sort of rooted in their families because of uh, artifacts that are passed down. And and like you, I have that same thing. I have. I have guns that have been passed down to me from uh, uh, uncles, fought my father, you know, and um, and those are th- th- those have all kinds of significance, all kinds of relational significance. Yeah, um, that's right. I have, I just have a couple now. One's a a shotgun, sporting clays you can use for hunting, like waterfowl hunting. My dad yeah, gave me yeah. and a deer rifle, and I haven't used either of them in years because I've just done. I was coaching soccer for a while, doing other things, and. I just, it's not, I don't enjoy it as much as my dad does. So it's not something I would just choose to do right away. But, I, you know, but yeah, even if I never use them again, which probably will at some point, but yeah, it's that same kind of like, they just remind me of my childhood of going hunting or going to the gun club and shooting skeet or trap and um, yeah, good memories. I mean, some of them not so good. I remember hunting for pheasant on the plains of Kansas and having to chip ice off of my gun in an ice storm. I mean, I'm just the misery of hunting in the winter. Um, or a cold goose, goose wind, <laughs> but still good memories, right? They stick out. Yeah. Yeah. They're meaningful and they become part of, uh, part of our own sense of, of who we are. Yeah. Um, in, in ways that non-gun owners, um, might have difficulty appreciating, but everybody has some, some parallel to that in, in their upbringing, I would imagine, or in their family yeah. history. Um, and so, so guns are, guns are complex. Gun ownership is a complex thing. And that's, that's probably what complicates the conversation is that uh, that that guns don't have the same meaning to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the and the violence that ensues if a person has never been either a perpetrator or a direct victim or even really close to 
an act of gun violence. It may be a little bit of a, a statistical abstraction to them. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, I don't know. It may not have the same kind of existential uh, impact, um, but particularly yeah, when we're, right. we're inundated with so many, uh, uh, so many statistics about so many things that are of egregious uh, nature in our world. It's really easy to get desensitized about that. Yeah, and I don't think, I mean, just whether it's gun violence or just broadly the violence and suffering in the world, I don't think, I just don't think God designed us to, we can't bear the weight of the world's suffering in that sense, right? Um, that's why we're part of the body of Christ. And so mm-hmm. the church can do it, but I can't. I mean, I, you could spend your day looking at, and I did some with its research, just terrible stories of gun violence. There's also beautiful stories of where gun violence was averted. But I mean, if we spend our days thinking about we need to act against human suffering, of course. But yeah, I think that if we spend too much of our focus is on it, yeah, I, I think we there's like a defense mechanism we just have to shut down. Yeah, uh, and to so survive I, I think psychologically. Yeah, that's right. And so we want to fight suffering without letting it, without real, without making that the whole story because there's so much good as well on the on the planet. Mm-hmm. Well, give us give us a little um, little advice, a little counsel on some some meaningful steps forward what have you found mm-hmm. that can be if if not you know eliminating the entire problem which none of us are going to do in our lifetimes probably yeah. um what what are, what are some meaningful steps forward where do you begin to find hope yeah so i will i'll just mention a a couple things having to do with, with legal th- like policy things but then sp- spend more time on others so uh, my own view i i do think that uh, extreme risk protection orders or what people call red flag laws. I think that there are versions of those that could be effective um, that protect gun rights, but also can reduce violence. And so basically the idea is, let's say medical professional, or even I have a family member and, and I think that they're in danger of harming themselves or others. You can say, I can't remember the legal term. I don't know about, I mean, I'm worried at 54, the things I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm just going to let it go <laughs> for now. But basically, you can submit a request to have the guns confiscated in a hearing. And so the judge would determine in this hearing whether or not, you know, there's reason to confiscate the guns temporarily. If not, then the person doesn't lose, you know, like my neighbor doesn't lose, you know, custody, so to speak, of his guns. If so, depending on that, it could be for months or a year and they can reapply and get them back. Now, the trick there is you want to make sure there's due process and not frivolous want to have safeguards so that it's not done frivolously, right? Okay. Just like any law could be abused. But it looks like there's some of the states that have these. Um, I mentioned in the book, Maryland, like they, they were documented about 300 shootings, including seven or eight school shootings that were arguably averted due to this. And so there's been some success and there are definitely people in the NRA, even that sort of far to the more conservative view that, that, that see that this could have a potential benefit. Um, would reduce gun violence. So it's something that's got a limited track record, record of success. And then I'm really becoming interested more recently because this deals with the suicide thing too, as as that would, um, but just safe storage, right? I think that's what's difficult for me because the, and probably you and many people, part of a gun ownership, the ethic I was taught as a kid was safe storage was vital. We didn't just, my guns, my dad's guns weren't just laying around the house. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, it was the sort of you don't pick up a gun unless you know what you're doing, unless you're going to be safe, conscientious, all those things. And so I think safe storage technology and laws, even mandating it could be, could be useful. You could do that in fairly inexpensive ways. Those two things together could make a big difference. Um, along the, I guess what I'd, what I'd say moral or spiritual or just non-legal solutions, you know, some of the things we've talked about already, just the church doing what it does, um, providing care. I mean, there's an epic, as we know of loneliness right now coming out yeah. of the, even before, but especially coming out of the pandemic. And so many people that, that if we could start alleviating that by inviting people or reaching out to people who are lonely, whether it's the, the 16 year old or the 46 year old white male, I mean, the majority of like most often people that die of suicide are, um, oh, I, they're older men. Well, I think it's, older yeah, white I think men. it's middle and upper middle age white men. That's right. And so let's, and, and you know, we tend to be, especially that age, I'm generation X, we're used to kind of, you know, going on our own, be, you know, and the church is like, that's one thing I've, I've loved the past 15 or 20 years of like developing much deeper friendships, but we can do that. We can, we can reach out to those people intentionally, um, provide places for youth to 
be loved, provide places where facilitate people who maybe are struggling with unemployment or poverty, provide care for them and even job training or jobs. So all those sorts of things, you start thinking about the causes of crime, the causes of gun violence, it's multifaceted. So let's do those things. And then there are even specific things that, then I would say, what can a church could say, we're doing these things. What's maybe one other thing we could do and within our capacity and our context, you know, so it's going to look different in a church where I'm in Richmond, Kentucky compared to Louisville, Kentucky, or Denver, Colorado, you know, versus Los Angeles, all these different things. So mm -hmm. I think just being creative and really being willing to talk about this issue. Um, I think in some churches it can be taboo because of the polarization. So even just discussing it, some, a friend of mine or an acquaintance of mine, who's a pastor for Southern Baptist church in West Virginia, he, he's an NRA member and also does some stuff to try both legally and spiritually reduce gun violence. He mentioned kind of the older guys in his church, he brought it up and they just said, look, we're not, we don't talk about that. I just sort of a, a sacred cow. And one thing as a Christian, we should be able to talk about anything. Otherwise it's a warning about idolatry. Yeah. Right. Second, second is, yeah, it's polarizing. But if the church, if we've got to start setting an example here and in all these controversial issues of, we can talk to one another in ways that even if we have different views, we're standing shoulder to shoulder in love, trying to figure out what's true not face to face. I want to win the argument. If we could do that here and in other places, man, we could, we could, yeah, we could see a lot of good things happen. Well, I really appreciate that. And, and particularly your emphasis on a, I think you called it a patchwork uh, yeah. approach, which is far more realistic. And, you know, if, if we can uh, make our peace with small gains and realize that small gains add up to significant gains, um, yeah. we, we could, we can probably get somewhere. Um, so so much of what you've said just strikes a, a note of, of of realistic hope mm -hmm. uh, for us, and and I appreciate that. Thanks for all the work that you've done to to bring the conversation to this point, and yeah. to share some time with us. We look forward to more of that uh, with you here in a few weeks, at least from the time we're recording this. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the. I mean, that's one of the things I appreciate about what the Gospel Initiative is doing. It's taking some of these difficult issues that some seminaries and churches just wouldn't touch because they're difficult, but providing a form where people can do it in a way that that is, yeah, Christ-like. I think, and, and you know, going, yeah, figuring out what what can we do and getting different views and trying to work through, do the hard work of working through it. So I appreciate yeah. that too. Yeah, that that certainly is a desire of ours to provide a different way of having these conversations, so that they're not just recycling the same old polarizations. Yeah, um, and and it's hopefully great. we can get somewhere, and the Lord is honored, and yeah. and the Lord's purposes are fulfilled. So, yeah, let me add that the, the reason I have hope is that, and with all these things, is they're just not just up to us, right? We can yeah. it's our efforts, but it's in partnership with God and the Holy Spirit, and. Yeah, I mean, amazing things have happened in history when Christians stand together and, and work with God to try to make the world, yeah, make the world better, spread the gospel. Absolutely. And, and the Lord is, uh, is with us in those endeavors, however flawed our efforts may be. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've been talking to Dr. Michael Austin. I'm very grateful for your time with us. Uh, again, the, the book that he has written, published in 2020 by Erdman's, is God and Guns in America. I encourage you to get a copy of that and engage in this conversation too. Uh, again, friends, we're really grateful for the time that you've chosen to spend with us. And if you get a chance, please leave us a rating or a review wherever it is that you happen to listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to send us any comments or questions, you can do that at the following email address, which is podcast at denverseminary.edu. Uh, additionally, if you w visit our website, denverseminary.edu, you'll find a lot more information and resources uh, about us here at Denver Seminary, events, degree programs, other episodes of Engage 360, uh, and you can always get full transcripts of uh, each of our podcast episodes. So until next time, friends, may the Lord bless you. We look to, forward to interacting with you again very, very soon. Take care.